So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, Cowboy vs. Samurai, which you're seeing this evening. Uh, I am going to tell you um, a bit about the writer who made but a very, very little bit. Um, we stumped Gretchen Ross on this, and, and uh, as Sally Wright said, when Gretchen hasn't heard of the play, you know something's going on here. Because um, Gretchen is rather clever on these literary things, and the reason that Gretchen doesn't know it is that uh, this play and this writer has never been produced in these parts. Although I think Ince, when I introduce Ince, will tell us a little bit about the, the history of, of this particular uh, play. Um, but what I do want to tell you is that this is a contemporary American play by a man named Michael Galamco, who is of Chinese and, and um, Filipino heritage. Uh, he identifies as an Asian American writer of Chinese and Filipino heritage. And as such, a lot of the subject matter of this play is, uh, what is, is focused around what it means to be both Chinese, Filipino, and American, and in fact, what it means to be something slash something. So I'm an, I'm a Chi I'm an Asian American, but and in his case, as you'll see, one of the characters in the play, I'm sure is quite a personal creation because it's a character who knows he's Asian but is not sure particularly what Asian he is. And, and this, I'm sure, is, is speaking to something that Michael Galamco himself, himself uh, uh, grew up with. But why is it that we're doing this play right now? And there's, there's really two reasons for that. So often the plays that we, um, people often ask me as the artistic director, they'll say, Albert, they'll say, <laughs> how do you choose those plays? And the answer to that is, I don't, I listen to the artists that I'm, that, that, that I, uh, my job is to listen to the artists and, and what is passionately coming from, from the minds and the mouths of the artists. And in this case, Ince Choi, who as you know, came here in 2008 as part of the Soul Pepper Academy, is that right, Ken? You came with him. Uh, and has been with us now for, for eight years. Um, Ince and I have had an ongoing conversation about various things, and, and in and as part of that conversation came the suggestion that this play that he had read, Cowboy vs. Samurai, would be a wonderful play to do at this time in this company, in this city. And it fits, uh, so, so that's one reason, because one of the artists that we care the most about was passionate about doing this piece. So that's one way that makes it no different than, say, Daniel Brooks saying, I want to do Samuel Beckett's Endgame, or Joe Ziegler saying, I want to do Kaufman and Hart's You Can't Take It With You, or me saying, I want to do Tony Kushner's Angels in America. This was Ince Choi saying, Michael Galamco's Cowboy vs. Samurai is a play that I would love to see done here. That's one reason that's like all the other ones con connected to one artist. But then there's another reason that I want to give you a bit of context for. So those of you who were with us last May when we had an annual general meeting, um, we announced what our, uh, we announced the result of a couple of years of really heavy organizational thinking we'd been doing and sort of unpacking of all the things we'd done over the first 15 or so years of our existence. And we unpacked everything and re reorganized it. And we said, so what is this company? And what is this a company aspiring to? What is our mission, if you will, uh, in corporate terms? What is our mission over the next decade? And most specifically over the next half decade, because that's how far we can look out right now. And what we, what we looked at was a reorganization of what we es established ourselves, with, which was a tripartite mission. And you'll remember, those of you like Donald and Gretchen who've been here since the very beginning, you've, you've heard us say youth outreach, artist training, and great classics. That's how we started, with that tripartite mandate to, to enrich and inspire young people through the theater, to train the next generation of artists like Ince and Ken, whose work you'll see today, and then to put on the stage the great works of the world and vital Canadian interpretations. But as we came, became 15 years old and unpacked, we realized we were doing way, way, way more than that. And so what was it that we were doing and how to re reorganize it? And we reorganized things to, to say this last May, that Soul Pepper is ready to claim that it is a national civic theater. Not the National Civic Theater, but a National the Civic Theater. Therefore, thereby engaging other peoples to, to make this, the same claim and other companies to make the same claim. And the foundation of it is what we call the community. And above the community at about my knees, so if I'm, if I'm the, the, the company, I'm one of those Fisher-Price toy stacks with rings standing on me. Do you remember those? 
You got that image? So at my feet, the biggest ring right down that's, that's anchoring everything is what we call in the community. And about at my knees, we have a thing called in the future, and that's all our artist training. And then above that, we have a thing called in the pipeline, which is all the new work we're developing. And then we have right at ground level where everyone sees it, we have what we call on the stage, which is what you're seeing tonight, and all the shows that you see. And above that, we have on the road, which is taking stuff out. And then the last one is called on the air. Okay, now to tell you, to, to give that really clear example to explain how that works, let me talk about a guy named Ince Choi. Ince Choi, who is a resident artist in this building and plays a leadership role in this building on the, uh, what Ravi mentioned earlier, is the Ar Artistic Directors Council. So he sits inside one of the circles of the community itself. So he's down at the, at the, the bottom in the community. And then he came to us in the future in the Soul Pepper Academy. He spent two years here at the Soul Pepper Academy. And while he was doing that, he was continuing to work on a play that he wrote, a little play that he wrote while he was there. He was here as an actor, but he had a little play, Paul, on the back of his head that he was working on. And that little play came into focus and he handed it in. We thought, oh, that's really exciting. And then he said, can I send it into a fringe competition? We said, absolutely, of course. We're going to do a reading here, but send it in. And he sent it into the fringe competition and it won. And then winning the fringe competition, it went, it went and got a free berth in the Toronto Fringe and it won every award at the Toronto Fringe. And Soul Pepper ended up in a bidding war with David Mervish and everyone else. <laughs> to get the play that Ince Choi had written about his family's first generation, his first generation experience in this country. That play, of course, everyone already knows, it was called Kim's Convenience. So Kim's Convenience then in the beginning of 2012 started at this time of year, launched our Soul Pepper season. And Kim's Convenience has become the single biggest and most popular show we've ever done. Because not only has it now played five times on the stages of Soul Pepper, it has also played every major theater across the country. And so it has gone from the community, the pipe, the future, through the pipeline to the stage, from the stage. It's now gone on the road across the country. And the last piece you remember is called On the Air. And right now, Ince is in a writer's room with a bunch of really clever people and a whole bunch of people. And we had a meeting last week. He's going, this is actually happening because in June, we're beginning principal photography for the first of two seasons ordered by the, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation that, Ince Con that Kim's Convenience by Ince Choi, a Soul Pepper production, is going to be on CBC starting January of 2017 for two years. So how about that? So, and Ivan Fitzan, whose, whose name is on the, the has been through hit Thunderbird has, and sent Sandra Fair. Um, Ivan Fitzan has been instrumental in doing that. And in fact, Ivan Fitzan, when he came to see the very first run through of, of Ince's play, when we did it here, directed by Wayne Mangesha and, and designed by Ken McKenzie, and Ivan came in, this is way back in November of 2011, and he sat there and he watched this play and he walked out and he said, Oh, this is huge. He said, This is my story. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm the son of Ukrainian refugees. This is my story. And this is how it's happened to so many people. Now, the reason I tell this story is, first of all, to demonstrate how this model of a national civic theater works at Soul Pepper and how to take that one example of something that goes through that. But the other thing I want to tell you is this is just one of, you do not make a civic agenda of telling the stories of, of various pockets of this country in order to include them in a, in a mosaic that makes a, a national landscape without, you can't do that on one. You have to make a commitment to do more of that. You have to make a commitment as, an, as a national civic theater to make sure that, that where our feet are down in that community piece, the central thing we talk about when we talk about what does it mean to be in the community at Soul Pepper and what does it mean for Soul Pepper to anchor a community here in Toronto and in the country, to take a leadership role, what we say first is this place has to be a center of aspiration for artists, for audiences, and, and, and for students wherever their parents came from. And they have to believe that what happens here is for them. And this is core to what we're doing. And Ruby Jane, who you heard earlier, Ruby Jane, who's, who's now taking a leadership role here at Soul Pepper, one of his tasks is going to be over the next couple of years. We have decided about uh, over the last several months, we've, we've focused on one issue. We said, of all the things that we do, one thing we have to make sure of is that we set a very specific goal, a very specific, if you will, conversation as 
to what this, where we fit in a national ecology. And because, for obvious reasons, one needn't look beyond the front page of the newspaper in this city or in any European city or any city in the world right now to understand that the notion of inclusion of others, the notion of how do we accept and embrace and welcome others into our vision of a nation, our tolerant vision of what a nation can be. This is at the forefront of every, every person in the world right now for obvious reasons. It's also, obviously, at the forefront of our cultural conversation. The Oscars no white, for uh, all white, you know, that, that the, the, what's it called, Oscars so white. Um, there's, there's so, it's at the center of our cultural conversation and is absolutely at the center of our socio-political conversation, not only in this city, but throughout the world. And our job, we believe, our job as a national civic theater is to take a leadership role in that conversation. So we are going to be focused. We chose several months ago, and it's going to be announced soon, we chose that this whole organization, through what we put on its stages, who we bring in, the programs we do, like our wonderful New Canadians program that we started a couple of years where we've now welcomed about 80 families that have come to this country in the last couple of years who now have unlimited access to soul pepper and have gotten and they all have buddies within the company and we've done this and we have people from every part of the globe that feel that this place is now theirs and that's a program that's going to expand and expand and expand these are these are initiatives that we've established and we call this our civic issue and our civic issue for the next two years that this organization will be thinking about is inclusion what does it mean? How do, you how do you make it manifest, et cetera? And Rubby's gonna be at the center of the conversation and Ince has been at the center of the conversation with me for years. And it's got to manifest in all of those platforms, in the community, in the future, in the pipeline, on the stage, on the road, and in the air. Now we're doing it with Kim's convenience, but it can't be just that. Rubby Jane's beautiful, beautiful, and or entirely original production called Brimful of Asha that he made with his extraordinary mother, which is, an, again, another meditation on what it means to be the son of such strong and deeply felt and deeply embedded traditions, but traditions that have been transplanted into a country that the son has grown up with, and now there's a collision, a generational collision around how do we deal with your traditions and my new world and how do we live together in that and he did it in such a beautiful he and his mother made this beautiful humane meditation on this which is just delightful and it will be back it's been here twice it's going to come back that's one and tonight is part of that continuum because part of the inclusion is we have to not only as rubby did last year with his beautiful and the ints was in that that the award-winning production of accidental death of an anarchist that that put kawa ada an afghani uh, Canadian at the center of, of this play and he won the award as the best actor of the year at the Doras and here we had at Soul Pepper directed by someone of South Asian descent who's directing a play by an Italian uh, on in a Toronto stage and we have a South, a, 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 a South Asian artist South Asian Canadian artist directing an Afghani Canadian artist in a, an award-winning role in a production that wins best production. This is part of what we have to continue to do. And tonight is that continuum because we're taking a contemporary Asian American play. You're going to see four actors on the stage, all of them very, very talented, and all of them making their Soul Pepper debut tonight. Three of them are from the Asian diaspora. And this is an opportunity for them because we have to get, this is an opportunity not only to share the stage and share the building and share this incredible energy and, and air that's in this building with the people who are on the other side of this wall right now, people like Joseph Ziegler and, and Stuart Hughes who helped found this company and have been anchoring this, this, this um, incredible community for so long and yet the people coming out of their show are going to run into the people coming out of the other show and everyone is going to be celebrating the fact that we just have Canadian artists on our stages. And tonight you're going to see the next generation of Canadian artists, and they're under the leadership of someone who, is, who has done extraordinary things. It's, it's impossible to overestimate the impact of this man. This man that I'm about to introduce you to who came in here as a student, and I'm not talking about, I'm not putting pressure on you about your directing tonight. That's going to be, we're all, we'll all say later what we thought of that, right? 
but getting up to the moment where he goes into the room with those artists to tell this story that all of them feel that they can connect to in some way because it's part of their story. Up to that point, what Ince did by the, the bravery that he and Ravi both took in taking their own very, very personal story that had not been at the center of the cultural conversation in this country and actually had the guts to say, I actually believe this is at the center of the Canadian cult cultural conversation. And in doing so, it's, it's opened, it's blown open. The doors have been blown open. And it's now our collective responsibility to make sure that those doors stay open. Because they've been blown open by guys like this and we cannot let them shut. So that's, that's my challenge to me, because I think this is being, it's being recorded, and it's my challenge. <laughs> It's my challenge to all of us to keep, to keep those doors open. Yes? So, so um, nobody deserves uh, more, more thanks for that than this guy. And, and he's going to now, I think, tell you a little bit about the production you're seeing. And his, but I'm going to say no more except to say it's a great honor to introduce a graduate of the Soul Pepper Academy, one of the great artists in this country, Mr. Ince Choi. Um. Hello. How do you follow that? Uh, so I'll be, I'll try to be brief. Um, Cowboy vs. Samurai is a, is a small, unassuming romantic comedy about the uh, racial politics of dating preferences. Why we feel like we're attracted to this type of person rather than this person and the implications of that. Um, the play uh, has enjoyed productions in New York, Chicago, multiple times in LA, San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, Calgary even, <laughs> but never in Toronto. Uh, so it is my honor to be bringing this show here to, uh, to a new audience. Um, if there was an Asian, like an East Asian American canon, this play would be in there. I think it's one of the most produced Asian American plays in America, not in Canada. Um, Michael Golamko, uh, Filipino Chinese American playwright. He's a staff writer on the TV show Grimm. And I just found out on Facebook that he just pitched a new series on NBC that got greenlit. So in a year or two, his new series will be on air. Uh, so he's on the up and up. Um, when I first read this play, uh, I, I laughed and I cried. I laughed because uh, it's really funny. And I cried, not because it's sad or tragic, but it reminded me, it brought to the fore of my memory all these repressed, um, <laughs> all these repressed memories that I had growing up. Like I'm one of those Asians who um, give everybody the benefit of the doubt. My father was a pastor, and he's a very peaceful man. He was like, it's okay. It's okay. So I grew up <laughs> uh, with other Asian friends who are more politically charged and aggressive and violent even, and uh, you know, would cry out racism at the drop of a hat, where I'd be the guy that always like, hey, it's okay. Don't, they, they, they didn't know. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. It's, it's just, come on. Let's go. Let's just go. We've had too much to drink, let's get out of here. It's not worth it, it's not worth it. Let's just get out of here. Um, you know, and so all these, these memories came back of me being the only non-white uh, singer in the Toronto Boys Choir when I was like grade four to grade six. And I remember thinking, does anyone else notice that, I'm, that I look different? <laughs> like I thought I fooled everyone. They're all other white boys, great, had a great experience, but it was, okay, I think I fooled them, good. <laughs> or being the only non-white hockey player in my hockey league at Pleasant View Arena, Victoria Park and Finch, you know, and thinking I fooled everyone. <laughs> it's like, oh, no one's, okay, that's good. I'm, don't make any sudden movements and <laughs> we'll all get along and it's fine. Or, uh, you know, rugby team. I went to North Toronto Collegiate Institute. We had a rugby team. We played, and it was the only non-white uh, rugby player 
I mean, by then, you know, we all just kind of got along and, or the volleyball team or even theater at York University, the graduating class, the only non-white actor. And then, and then I remembered uh, grade six, there was this, and more connected to the play now, grade six, there was this girl, because we're being recorded, I won't name her name, <laughs> but she was this black girl and I liked her. She, she laughed at everything I said, which was great. <laughs> She was really smart, and uh, she had a birthday party, and we all went, and uh, there, was, uh, there was snacks, and uh, there was uh, breakdance music happening. We're all breakdancing, all of us grade sixes. And then someone put on slow dance music. And then everyone, I was like, how do you breakdance to this? Uh, I was very, very late in my blooming. Um, <laughs> and so everyone just kind of coupled up and started dancing, and... I didn't want to feel left out, so I went to. I knew her. Did you want to dance? She goes, yeah. And it was her birthday. No one was dancing with her, sorry. So we started dancing, as you do in grade six, just. And then we started talking, and it was it was great. We had a great time, and then it just we danced more, and and then on Monday. <laughs> so that was Friday. On Monday at school, word got around that we were going around. We didn't call it going out for some reason. I don't know. Scarborough's weird. We called it going around. Are you going around with her? So then uh, this, this Asian friend of mine came up to me and said, are you going out with that black girl? And I wasn't. So I said, no, I'm not. He goes, oh, good. And I felt like, I felt that pressure of, I wasn't supposed to do that. Or there was a, uh, Racial politics had taken place in the grade six, in grade six in Scarborough, and I was unaware of it. And I was like, oh, I wasn't supposed to do that for some reason, but I was, truth, I was, I was truthful because I wasn't really going out with her. We just danced. In grade 11, I went out with this other girl. Uh, I, only, I didn't go out with many girls. I'm like my five girls in my life. But she was white. I'm not going to name her name. She was white. And when news went out that I was going out with her in high school, people asked the question, how the heck did Ince land this white girl? And, I, and immediately I was very proud of that. I was like, yeah, how did I land? As if she's like a tuna fish or something, I don't know. How did I land her? And then I thought, wait a minute, the presuppositions of that question, why wouldn't I be able to land her? I was insulted. Um, so stories like these came to the fore of my mind and filled the rehearsal hall with the stories of all the other actors, stage management, as we just kind of wrestled through issues in this play, which is a lighthearted romantic comedy, by the way, uh, a digestible form. But we had a great time uh, putting, the, putting the show together, and I hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoyed putting it together. Thank you. Um, one thing I will tell you, those of you who um, think they're at a classical theater company, is that, that when Ince first um, approached me about this play, before I had read it, he said, there's this great Asian-American play based on Cyrano. And in fact, Galamco himself says that his starting off point was Edmund uh, Rostand's Cyrano de Bergerac. And if you remember the central, the, the, the sort of, um, the central dramatic conceit in Cyrano is man who thinks he can't get the girl, um, but is in love with the girl, sees very handsome man that girl is in love with and decides that he's going to somehow, and this, this arrangement gets made where if I woo her with my language, through the handsome and, and allow the, the, the best I can get is to have her fall in love with my words. So he writes letters as a surrogate to Christian, who Roxanne falls madly in love with. And then, of course, if you remember in Cyrano, by the end of his life, in fact, and this one is much more lighthearted, <laughs> on the day that Cyrano dies, Roxanne discovers that all along the man that she loved was the man that she passed over because she looked only at the cover and not at the book inside. And 
so, so this play takes its, its um, springboard from there. Beyond that one conceit, which does get mentioned, you, I think you still mentioned it in the play that we know that, so I'm not giving anything away. In the, you'll, you'll, everyone in the audience will know that quite early on. Um, but once that happens, it just, then the play becomes entirely its own thing, but it absolutely, um, Galamco, as any smart writer, steals from the best. And he looked back at that and used that as his, his jumping off point. So, um, and let's take a, a nice laughing spirit in um, and enjoy. And thank you so much for being here for Cowboy vs. Samurai. Thank you. Thank you.